Now, a couple of weeks ago, I tried to use ChatGPT for a hill of development. And the problem is that ChatGPT only knows things until about 2021 and Hilla came out after that. So while it did give me an answer, it was very generic. There was nothing specific to the actual Hilla product that would help me in actually implementing any of these things. So really what I started wondering is like, what would it take to kind of customize ChatGPT by giving it our documentation as reference material so that I could get more useful information and it turned out it actually worked really well. So by feeding it in some relevant piece of information from our documentation, I was able to ask the same question and actually get a pretty good description of how to actually secure my endpoint to give some kind of code examples on how that works. And that's what I want to show you today, just on a high level, how that works. So the challenge we have is that ChatGPT is limited to data up until 2021. Now, many models like BARD, Bing, WebGPT allow doing internet searches for more up-to-date information. The problem still is that we can't really affect what it finds. So in our case, we have many versions over the years and some of these have API changes. So it would be very kind of handy for me to be able to say that I want specifically uh, documentation for one version, the one that I'm using to be used. Again, our documentation keeps getting updated all the time. So we would somehow want to be always able to kind of give the latest and greatest documentation as input. And finally, we have a limitation of how much context we're able to feed into ChatGPT. Right now, that limit is about 4,000 uh, tokens or around 3,000 words or so. And that needs to include also the response text. So we don't have a whole lot of space so we can't just feed in all the documentation. We need to figure out what are the most relevant pieces of documentation that we can give uh, ChatGPT to answer a given question. So the way I solve this was using embeddings. Now, if you're not familiar with embeddings, let me start with an example. If you're very used to color picker, you probably know that you can take essentially any color and represent that as a red, green, blue value, essentially a vector with three elements responding to red, green, and blue values. So two colors that are similar to each other will have very similar values. Two colors that are very far away from each other will have very different values. Now, embeddings are very similar to that idea, just that they take as input essentially any text. So there is a API in OpenAI we can call to get an embedding for a piece of text, which is a vector of about 1,500 dimensions. And that kind of vector then represents a point in a very large dimensional space uh, that corresponds to this uh, piece of text meaning. Now, I'm not very good at drawing in 1500 dimensions, so I'll try to illustrate this in two dimensions instead. So say that we go through our documentation and we take small sections of it and encode all of these into vectors and place them kind of in a two dimensional space here. Now, when a user comes in and asks a question, what we need to do is take that question, run the same embedding uh, algorithm on it to get a new vector. And then what we can do is we can search our database for the most kind of closely related pieces of documentation to this query. And those are really good candidates for us to include in the prompt. So in the prompt, I first of all gave a system message here, defining that this would be a Hilodox assistant. I'm passing in all the relevant documentations here. So I essentially take those 10 or so documents that I find and I concatenate them and pass them in here. And I then instruct it to answer the questions using all the, the above information and not to make up any answer. So we're trying to kind of reduce the amount of hallucination and just made up answers that ChatGPT might give us otherwise. We then send this over to ChatGPT. It does its thing for a while and we get a pretty good answer back. So in this case, we get a fairly good uh, kind of example code snippet of what a login form might look like. So what you need for this to work is essentially two parts, processing the documentation and then doing the search. When processing the documentation, what you need to do is split your documentation into meaningful sections. You want to keep these sections like fairly uh, small and kind of about the same thing. So uh, in order for these vectors, these embedding vectors to have a meaningful value, you don't want to cover too many different topics within that same piece of text. So try to keep them kind of uh, relevant on the same topic. So what I did in my case was I looked at 
the HTML headings and I took essentially each heading as a section. We then generate embeddings for each one of those sections and we store those embeddings along with their source text in a vector database. Then when a user comes in and asks the question, we take that user question, we generate an embedding with the same algorithm, and then we query our vector database for the closest matches to that. We then put together this prompt and we try to essentially fit in as much of this source material as we can into the prompt, but still leaving enough space for the answer. We then call ChatGPT uh, and we get an answer and we display that. So why use vector embeddings and not say fine tune a model or train an entirely new model? One very big kind of benefit here is that this is very quick and cheap. So when I was doing my kind of initial research and playing around, I was just kind of emptying the entire database, recreating it. And anytime just running that uh, kind of embedding process for the entire documentation costs about 10 cents. So it's fairly cost effective. If I wanted to, I could do essentially checksums on different documentation files and only run this whenever they change. So I don't have to keep redoing this work unnecessarily. And what I could do also is I could split the documentation based on this framework version or tech stack and into different namespaces. And that allows the user to select the specific framework that they want to have as the context for their chat. A kind of surprising side benefit to this was that I realized that you could actually ask questions in many different languages uh, using this. So even though our source documentation is only in English, ChatGPT is really good at translating. So I was able to ask questions in Finnish, Swedish, Spanish, and I got back really good answers. So that's also a way for us to make our documentation more accessible to a wider audience. All right, so that's it on a high level. I'll leave some link to further reading and the source code below. So if you have any questions, ask in the comments below. And thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Bye.